Hello, and thank you for tuning in. This video is about eControl Studio, which is the software used to control Diamond Edge impact etching machines offered by our company. In this particular video, we'll talk about starting your etching job and about resuming interrupted etching jobs. The voice you're hearing is that of Andrei Larionov, director of Economical Solutions Corporation. Our company designs, manufactures, and supports unique diamond engraving machines. Unlike lasers that burn the stone, our machines physically hit it with the sharpened diamond tip. That is why we call this process impact etching. Our machines are purpose-built for use in monument industry and are mostly used to put portraits and images on monuments and headstones. You can find more about our machines by going to www.impactetching.com. So let's talk about positioning your etching head. Once you have created layout for your etching, either use a canvas functionality of eControl, of which we, about which we had a previous video, or by putting your layout together in a raster editor like Photoshop. So once you created that layout, it's time to initialize your etcher and position your etching head. In previous videos, you have seen how to do that from eControl Studio. In this video, I will show you how to do the same using the remote keyboard that is provided with your purchase of our machines. The purpose of this remote is to allow you to come closer to the etching head as you position it and better see where it is uh, because the cable are, that the remote is attached to allows you to walk around your machine uh, much easier and come closer to current position of the etching head. I hope you remember how in previous videos we talked about the need to initialize your etcher before you start uh, positioning the head. Once you turn your machine on, it will take a while to load, during which it will flash orange, the small LED on top. And then once the machine is started, this LED will be green with brief flashes of red. Those flashes of red mean that machine has not been initialized yet. So to initialize the machine, you press and hold the mode button in the middle of your remote control until it beeps. And then once it's beeped, you release the button. So basically, uh, if your etcher is already initialized, which is denoted by this LED on top being solid green, there's no need to reinitialize it again. And uh, if it's initialized, obviously, there's no need to press this mode button again. Now, what you do, you use the arrow buttons to move, this green arrow buttons to move the etching head in horizontal plane and you, you use the um, Z buttons to move the etching head up and down. Obviously, before moving, um, unless it's done already, move the etching head all the way up to make sure that while you're moving the head, it will not hit the stone, okay? And then the, the actual movement occurs by pressing those buttons, as I just said, changing the speed of movement, of positioning. Uh, for that, we have this button called select speed. So once you select speed, it will cyclically switch between those three options, low, medium, high. And then once you change the speed, you can move the edge of that. Uh, there's another nice feature in this remote. There's this tiny black button that turns on this small LED flashlight, which helps you uh, basically light the area to uh, where the etching head is located, so can you better so, so that you can better see where the tip will be versus the stone. Okay. Now let's talk about making sure that the surface of material 
is located within the control range within the vertical control range of the etching head movement. Just wanted to quickly explain uh, the strange setup that you're witnessing here. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the small compact machine that I just use in my office to shot these videos. And uh, in here, I just printed out the paper that kind of represents some kind of stone or some kind of monument. In reality, it's actually much larger in a typical case. In, um, in, in, like, in your production situation, the compact machine is designed to be put directly on top of the stone. So right where you see my table, my desk, uh, that's the surface of the stone uh, in a typical production use of compact machine. Uh, if you do use one of our stationary machines, then the stone is fed in uh, between the legs of the machine. You just you just fit it in underneath and uh, you just lower the etching head to the stone surface. So um, positioning the stone versus the control range of the engraving head movement is very important. So um, I wanted to step back and show you a small diagram here that explains how machine works, which will help you a lot in understanding why why it's important. So this is like a small small sketch that shows the diamond tip and uh, the surface of the stone. So if you look closer into the etching process, the etching head floats above the surface of material at the distance of approximately 0. well, one hundredth of an inch or in metric units, it's uh, 0 0.25 millimeters. Actually, it's, it's even smaller, but just for simplicity of this discussion, let's assume it's one hundredth of an inch, which is really small gap. And that gap is critical to stable and predictable quality of etching. So while the tip flows at that distance from the stone, it also vibrates, hitting the stone with a frequency of 200 hits per minute or 200 hertz. Any deviation from this gap that you see will cause deterioration of the quality of etching. So how are we ensuring the stability of the gap given that the stone surface is never perfectly level or perfectly flat? Well, my diagram shows the stone as kind of flat. In reality, because the polishing machines apply more pressure at the edges of the stone. The stone surface looks more like this, and obviously it's an exaggerated picture, but stone surface recedes towards the edges of the stone. And moreover, uh, in order for us to simplify the use of the machine, we do not request that you do perfect leveling of the stone. So in production situation, your stone actually might look a little bit like this, right? Like this. It might be a little bit um, under uh, inclined, right? So how do we do that? How do we maintain that stable gap if the stone is neither perfectly level nor perfectly flat? Well, the answer to that is that uh, we have a floating head. Our etching head will always change the distance um, between the diamond tip and material by constantly adjusting, moving up and down uh, perpetually during the etching process. This is, the, uh, this is, by the way, the new version of our etching machine, which does not even have the gap sensor. The previous version, we had a, a lever that was always sliding on top of the stone, uh, thus giving us the reading of where stone is. In this machine, the etching head and the, the diamond tip itself acts both as actuator, that means as the tool to hit the stone, as well as the sensor to actually tell us where the stone is. If you were to uh, remove the lid uh, of this etching head, which I totally don't advise you to do, but you were, if you were to look inside, you would see that there's a motor that constantly moves the head up and down, okay? So the implication of what I've explained is, uh, the etching head will adjust up and down to track the surface of material, but it can only adjust within the physical range of its movement. It can only move down or up uh, for so long until it hits the, 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 the ends of its physical range. And that physical range is approximately 
uh, 1.77 inches, or in metric units, it's 45 millimeters. So before doing your actual etching job, what we encourage and advise that you do is making sure that all of all points of the stone surface are in fact located within that within that range of z axis vertical movement how to do that actually much much easier to do than it might i might have made it sound do you see this diagram that i'm circling right now with my with my mouse hold on i'll try to i'll try to highlight it somehow so i'm using my highlighter to highlight this area on the screen so that diagram basically shows with this arrow against this scale it shows the current position of the etching head so before you start your etching job what i would totally advise you to do is to position your etching head in all four corners in all four corners of your future uh, etching like I'm doing now and then use the so-called surface sensing procedure by pressing this button that um, I'm going to highlight again this button what are what the surface sensing procedure will cause the etching head to do is to go all the way down until it senses the stone and then to stop right well i probably didn't position it close enough uh, to the to the to the corner but well let's assume it's in the in, it's in the corner of the stone now so i'm pressing this surface sensing procedure and now it sends the stone and it shows me where the stone right now is located versus the control range of the etching head movement and it's kind of low but it's still not at the edge so i'm okay as a matter of fact the the example i'm showing you is uh, applies to large machines mostly or to the cases when you put a tile inside of a frame of a compact machine because when you just put a compact machine on top of the on top of the stone uh compact machines are designed to kind of automatically ensure that uh, when you put it on top of the stone the stone surface is within the range but uh, for a lot of other clients who do, uh, for a lot of our clients who use large machines or who are, who have different arrangement, different physical arrangement between machine and the stone, it, it really pays to make sure that uh, surface of the stone is within the range as we're doing now. So continuing where I stopped, what I recommend is to do this surface sensing procedure in all four corners of your future etching on the assumption that if all four corners are okay and within the range, then by extension, any any place in stone in between or any other any other spot in the stone is also within range. So just move your etching head into all four corners of your future etching, um, of your intended etching. Uh, do this surface sensing procedure in every corner. Check this diagram that I'm kind of pointing with my mouse right now to make sure that it's within the range, within the green range of the head movement. And as long as four corners are okay, as long as all four corners are okay, uh, that means that you can go ahead and start your etching. Th this is the extremely important part, important thing to check. And after some point, you probably kind of intuitively know that your surface, surface of your future etching is within the range. And you might, you might skip this procedure but in the beginning when you're just learning how to use our in the beginning when you're just learning how to use our machines it's definitely advisable to do that the next topic i wanted to mention is making sure that the material that you're etching on is not moving versus the machine and there are two ways that they can move versus each other the material can move or the machine can move so when when the etching is ongoing uh, please don't lean over the frame of the machine don't move it obviously uh, that takes care of machine not moving, but also the stone that you etch on should not move during the etching process. When you move, when you are etching on the big blank on a big mo big granite slab, that kind of usually not a problem because big big chunks of granite uh, don't move that easily. However, quite often what uh, many customers do, they do small proofs on tiles like this is a in, in my case uh, a 12 by 12 inch tile which can be very cheaply obtained at uh, must uh, tile stores and interior 
um, interior stone are uh, shops and uh, they are just regular polished granite and they are very well suited for for proofs however when you're doing the proof with such a tile there are two things that can happen the tile itself can wobble like actually is the case in my in my case here and the tile can actually slide if you put a tile on a um, kind of smooth surface it can actually slide during the the etching job and cause distortions in your um, in your etching so prior to starting your etching job in case you use any kind of tile or even smaller piece of granite make sure that a it does not slide laterally and b that it does not wobble um, the method that i found uh, very effective uh, and also primitive at the same time and it has to be primitive to in order to be simple i just take the uh, this is just the paper tissue or the regular paper tissue and i um i make it uh, slightly damp or wet actually i put it under water and then i press out um, excess water and now it's uh, it's soaked with water, but not to the degree that it will drip. Uh, so then what I'll do next, I'll just use that. And it's really just one or two layers. Don't overdo the number of layers, because if you do put too many layers, then it will start playing up and down as, as a caution of sorts. And that's not what we want either. So if you use just two or three layers of damp paper tissue as a base for your tile, you'll be surprised how firmly it will hold the tile versus lateral movement and it actually solves the problem of uh, of wobbling um, so this is the method I <laughs> I came to after many years of experimenting and I totally recommend you use it for your proofs so now the most exciting part is continuing interrupted etching job machine is designed to continue any job that was interrupted from some reason uh, and that reason could be that you just had to shut down the machine and close the program and uh, go home. Or uh, it can be power interruption or it can be just some fluke that caused machine to uh, stop etching and restart, which happens very rarely, but it might still happen. Uh, so we, we usually instruct you and still do um, re recommend that you connect your machine through the so-called power backup device, which will do two functions. It will filter power surges, and it will also prevent your machine, your etcher, from going down should the electricity completely shut off. But not everybody does that. And even if electricity shuts off, that power backup device usually will, will be sufficient for a few hours, like two, three, five hours. And if you do a very long etching job, it might still not help. So. And uh, now I will demonstrate two ways to continue your interrupted etching job. One is where you interrupted um, uh, deliberately, let me put it this way. You just want to stop etching job and continue it later. And another one, um, when we just completely turn off the etcher uh, while it's etching and then see if we can recover from that uh, abnormal situation. So let's do the method number one. Um, I'm going to open the file with uh, the plaque that we were preparing earlier. I'll just open the one we did for perimeter walk test. So um, I'm starting the etching job and I need to remember to select middle of the side as a starting position. That's what I did. So here's what we will do now. Uh, that is the business case or case number one, um, voluntary job interruption, if you want. So I'm going to start the etching job. Then after a few seconds into the etching job, I'm going to pause, close the program, shut down the etcher, turn the etcher back on and see if I can continue the job from the same space, from the same place, from the same spot.
So after some time of running the job, I decided that I want to interrupt it from some reason. Then I'm just closing the program. I don't need to save the changes to project. And uh, I'm just turning off the etcher. Then I'm turning it back on. After a couple of minutes, uh, the etcher is restarted. And uh, it actually shows green with brief flashes of red, that, that LED on top of it, which means it needs to be reinitialized. But our program should take care of all of that. So I'm going to start eControl Studio. If everything went to plan, which is supposed to, then um, I should get the notification asking if I want to continue interrupted job, which I did. So I'm saying, would you like to resume? Yes. There's another warning to remove any objects that might prevent um, movement of the etching head to its home position. By the way, it's kind of obvious that between the time you interrupted and between the time you continued, you should not move or touch this, the stone or the etcher to make sure that they are in the same physical position versus each other, right? I guess that's, that's kind of obvious. So machine will first initialize because it's not initialized. Then it will... Um, it will move to the place where, where we stopped and continue the etching from, uh, from there. Very well. So as you see, uh, we were able to perfectly continue etching from the same spot. And you will not, if nothing was moved versus if, if machine didn't, wasn't, wasn't touched or the stone wasn't moved, you will not be able to see any difference on transi transition. It will be a continuous etching. Now, the next uh, experiment I would like to do, which is slightly more risky and something that I totally not recommend you do, Turning off the etcher while it's working is really a shock to, to the equipment. And we, we, have, uh, we have this function of continuing in, in such extreme cases, but it's not something that I would recommend you try in your daily life. So wait until that happens to you and then, and then use this function, but don't do it kind of causally, okay? So for this, for this demonstration though, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna continue etching right now. And then in the middle of the etching, I will just shut down the etcher. I will just turn it off. And uh, once the etcher is turned off, another thing that, that I would need to do is close program. Just whatever the program tells you, just close it. Don't try to continue because the etcher is down, right? Um, don't press any continue buttons in the program. The key to being able to successfully continue interrupted etching, which was interrupted because machine shut down uh, all of a sudden, is to just close the program. Don't try to do anything in the program. and if, if the etcher is still kind of turned on, just turn it off, right? I mean, because there might be different situations. I mean, there might be some bug in the, in the software that all of a sudden caused the etcher to stop. Um, very unlikely, but uh, possible. So just turn off the etcher, close the program, turn on the etcher, open the program, and then you'll be prompted to resume from the same place. Okay, so uh, that's the plan. I'm going to continue now, and then in the middle of the etching job, I'm going to turn off the etcher. All right. So we turned off the etcher. I'm closing eControl, eControl Studio. And I'm turning the etcher back on so that it can it can load first. It takes, it takes approximately a couple of minutes for the etcher to start, during which it loads all of its software and uh, starts up all of its controllers. And while that process is ongoing, you will see the um, the orange light flashing on the top. And as I said earlier. Once the etcher is 
boot it up, uh, that light will switch to either solid green if the etcher is continue, uh, if the etcher is uh, still initialized, or it will be solid green with brief flashes of red, which means etcher is up but not yet initialized. Okay, so the etcher is up. Now, if everything went to plan, I'm going to launch eControl Studio and should be able to continue etching from exact same spot. Give it a few seconds to recognize that there was a job that was interrupted. Now it asks me to, if I want to resume, I'm pressing yes. Another warning saying that you need to remove everything from the working field to make sure that the etching head does not hit anything when it's initializing. First, the etching head will go to its home position to initialize. And then it's supposed to continue from the same spot. Wonderful. I'm not sure about you, but I'm amazed every time I, I have to demonstrate this. So what it means is, even if electricity fails all of a sudden, in majority of cases, and we don't guarantee 100% of cases, but very close to 99%, I would say, you will be able to continue from the same spot where the job was interrupted. Having said that, please do buy that uh, power backup still, because it will protect you from power surges and eliminate some risk of not being able to continue a job in case the electricity fails. I guess that's it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. And in the next video, we'll talk about a very important topic, that is how to calibrate your machine to achieve ideal etchings by setting up material definition. See you in the next video. Thank you.